end of Frankenstein and we're going from uh, I think I'll start from the very bottom page 166 so we're going to finish chapter 24. So we've just had uh, the end of Frankenstein um, and of course he wants to continue he dies smile passed from his lips untimely extinction of this glorious spirit but I journey towards England and there might I find consolation. So uh, Walton's devastated weeping interrupted. What do these sounds portend? It is midnight, the breeze blows fairly and the watch on deck scarcely stir. Again, there's the sound of a human voice, but hoarser. It comes from the cabin where the remains of Frankenstein still lie. I must arise and examine. Good night, my sister. Great God, what a scene has just taken place. I am yet dizzy with the remembrance of it. I hardly know whether I shall have the power to detail it, yet the tale which I have recorded would be incomplete without this final and wonderful catastrophe. I entered the cabin with the remains of my ill-fated and admirable friend. Over him hung a form which I cannot find words to describe, gigantic in stature, yet uncouth and distorted in its proportions. As he hung over the coffin, his face was concealed by long locks of ragged hair. But one vast hand was extended in colour and apparent texture like that of a mummy. So again, if we think about kind of the Michelangelo. God reaching out for man. Now, of course, the crea creature is reaching out for his creator. When he heard the sound of my approach, he ceased to utter exclamations of grief and horror and sprung towards the window. Never did I behold a vision so horrible as his face or such loathsome yet appalling hideousness. I shut my eyes involuntarily and endeavoured to recollect what were my duties with regard to this destroyer. I called on him to stay. He paused, looking on me with wonder, and again turning towards the lifeless form of his creator, he seemed to forget my presence, and every feature and gesture seemed instigated by the wildest rage of some uncontrollable passion. That is also my victim, he exclaimed. In his murder, my crimes are consummated, brought together. The miserable series of my being is wound to its close. Oh, Frankenstein, generous and self-devoted being, what does it avail thee that now I ask thee to pardon me? I, who irretrievably destroyed all things by destroying all thou lovest, alas, he's cold, he cannot answer me. His voice seemed suffocated, and my impulses, which had suggested to me the duty of obeying the dying request of my friend and destroying his enemy, were now suspended by a mixture of curiosity and compassion. So he's going to do the will of Frankenstein and destroy the creature. Frankenstein called him duties. I leave it to your judgment. Undertake my unfinished work. But he doesn't. He has curiosity and compassion. I approached this tremendous being. I dared not again raise my eyes to his face. There was something so scary and unearthly in his ugliness. I attempted to speak, but the words died away on my lips. The monster continued to utter wild and incoherent self-reproaches. At length, I gathered resolution to address him in a pause of the tempest of his passion. Your repentance, I said, is now superfluous. If you had listened to the voice of your conscience and heeded the stings of remorse... Before you had urged your diabolical vengeance to this extremity, Frankenstein would yet have lived. And do you dream, said the demon, do you think I was then dead to agony and remorse? <laughs> he continued, pointing to the corpse. He has not suffered in the consummation of the deed. Oh, not ten thousandth portion of the anguish that was mine during the lingering detail of its execution. A frightful selfishness hurried me on while my heart was poisoned with remorse. Think you the groans of Clerval were music to my ears? My heart was fashioned to be susceptible of love and sympathy. The noble savage of romanticism or the tabula rasa of John Locke's theories. And when wrenched by misery to vice and hatred, it did not endure the violence of the change. Without torture, as such, you cannot even imagine he became evil. And it destroyed him. After the murder of Clerval, I, be 
I returned to Switzerland heartbroken and overcome. I pitied Frankenstein. My pity amounted to horror. I abhorred myself. But when I discovered that he, the author at once of my existence and of its unspeakable torments, dared to hope for happiness in marriage with Elizabeth, but while he accumulated wretchedness and despair upon me, he sought his own enjoyment in feelings and passions from the indulgence which I was forever barred. So he's going to get married. I'm forever debarred from this. And this is interesting about never and deferrals, this kind of wanting companionship, wanting lasting uh, kind of yeah, you know, love, emotion, possibility, possibles. They're, they are barred from this. Impotent envy and bitter indignation filled me with an insatiable thirst for vengeance. I recollected my threat and resolved that it should be accomplished. I knew what I was preparing myself for, a deadly torture, but I was the slave, not the master of an impulse which I detested, yet I could not disobey. So the doppelganger bound into one another again. Frankenstein could get married, the creature cannot. Deferrals, what humans can have, what the clones cannot. And therefore he becomes evil. He's the kind of slave of this, a little bit like Tommy at the end of Never Let Me Go, the slave to his rage. But then Tommy, of course, by contrast, becomes passive and accepts his humanity. So Tommy, by contrast, accepts the human condition. Or the condition he of clone. as he, like the Japanese of uh, Mononoware, accepts the brevity of life. The creature rages. Does it change the outcome for either of them, though? And that's an interesting thing in both Shelley and Ishiguro. Does raging... Give them more hope. It's an interesting question they both seem to raise. Does raging give them more hope? Does it change things? And he's the slave to passion, very gothic, slave to passion. Yet when she died, nay, then I was not miserable. I had cast off all feelings, subdued all anguish to riot in the excess of my despair. Evil thenceforth became my good. That's re repeated from earlier. Urged thus far, I had no choice but to adapt my nature to an element which I had willingly chosen. The completion of my demoniacal design became an insatiable passion. So what's happened to this noble savage? What's happened is society has caused him to choose evil and the irony is is by connecting with society he learns society's hatred of him and that makes him evil so it's actually society of course that causes his evil the completion of my diet this is there's my last victim i was at first touched by the expressions of his misery yet when i called to mind what frankenstein had said of his powers of eloquence and persuasion and when i again cast my eyes on the lifeless form of my friend Indignation was rekindled within me. Wretch, I said, it is well you come here to whine over the desolation you have made. You throw a torch into a pile of buildings, and when they are consumed, you sit among the ruins and lament the fall. Hypocritical fiends! If he whom you mourn still lived, still would he be the object. Again would he become the prey of your accursed vengeance. It's not pity you feel. You lament only because the victim of your malignity is withdrawn from your power. Oh, it is not thus, not thus, interrupted the being. Yet such must be the impression conveyed to you by what appears to be the purpose of my actions, purpose of my actions. Yet I seek not a fellow feeling in my misery. No sympathy may I ever find. When I first sought it, it was the love of virtue, feelings of happiness and affection, which my whole being overflowed. And I wish to be participated. You would like to be a part of something. But now that virtue has, has become to me a shadow and happiness and affection are turned into bitter loathing and despair. What should I seek for sympathy? I'm content to suffer alone while my suffering shall endure. And when I die, I'm satisfied that the abhorrence and opprobrium 
should load my memory. Once my fancy was soothed with dreams of virtue, of fame and of enjoyment. Now we've got quite an interesting link with Ruth. Hope. Hoping for more than their position. Mistreated, physically abused, his father hates him. Hope. He had hope. Ruth had hope to the end. He had hope. Once I falsely hoped to meet with beings who, pardoning my outward form, would love me for the excellent qualities which I wasn't capable of unfolding. But I was nourished with high thoughts of honour and devotion. But now crime has degraded me beneath the meanest animal. No guilt, no mischief, no malignity, no misery can be found comparable to mine. When I run over the frightful catalogue of my sins, cannot believe that I am the same creature whose thoughts are once filled with sublime and transcendent visions of beauty and majesty of goodness. But it is even so. Fallen angel Lucifer, paradise lost. The fallen angel becomes a malignant devil. But even that enemy of God and man had friends and associates in his desolation. I am alone. So he's been destroyed by humanity. He was complex, human, intellectual, a noble savage, a blank slate, and humanity destroyed him. Lucifer in Paradise Lost had companions in his devilishness. You, who call Frankenstein your friend, seem to have knowledge of my crimes and his missing misfortunes but in the detail which he gave you of them he could not sum up the hours and months of misery which i endured wasting in impotent passions for while i destroyed his hopes i did not satisfy my own desires they were forever ardent and craving i still desired love and fellowship and i was still spurned was there no injustice in this, am I to be thought the only criminal when humankind sinned against me? Now, that's such an interesting question. Hear my tale being heard. The rhyme of the ancient mariner. Justice, human justice. How treatment of outsiders in both. You know, there wasn't time to ask the sensible questions. It says it never. I wanted you back in the shadows. Am I to be thought the only criminal? Are the clones, the outsiders, are they to blame? Humanity. Why do you not hate Felix, who drove his friend from the door with contumely? Why do you not execrate that rustic who sought to destroy the saviour of his child? No, they are virtuous and immaculate beings. I, the miserable and abandoned, am an abortion to be spurned at, kicked and trampled on. Even now my blood boils at the recollection of this injustice. But it is true that I am a wretch. I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have strangled the innocent as they slept. This is kind of almost a magna isis, isn't it? I grasped to death the throat of his throat who never injured me or another living thing. I have devoted my creator, the select specimen of all that's worthy of love and admiration among men, to misery. I have pursued him, even to that irredeemable ruin. There he lies, white and cold in death. You hate me, but your abhorrence cannot equal that with which I regard myself. I look on the hands which executed the deed. I think on the heart in which the imagination of it was conceived and long for the moment when these hands will meet my eyes, when that imagination will haunt my thoughts no more. Fear not that I shall be the future instrument of future mischief. My work is nearly complete. Neither yours nor any man's death is needed to consummate the series of my being and accomplish that which must be done, but it requires my own. Do not think that I shall be slow to perform this sacrifice. I will quit your vessel on the ice raft which brought me thither, and I will seek the most northern extremity of the globe. I shall collect my funeral pile and consume to ashes this miserable frame, and its remains may afford no light to any curious and unhallowed wretch who would create another such as I have been. I shall die. I shall no longer feel the agonies which now consume me or be the prey of feelings unsatisfied yet unquenched. He is dead who called me into being and when I shall be no more the very remembrance of us both will speedily vanish. 
I shall no longer see the sun or stars, feel the wind play on my cheeks. Light, feeling and sense will pass away. And this condition really is interesting, isn't it? This, this condition, human condition. And in this condition must I find my happiness. I need to accept this fate, acceptance. Comment upon humanity in both. How do we treat our creations? Some years ago, when the images with which this world affords first opened upon me, I know I felt the cheering warmth of the summer and heard the rustling of the leaves and the warbling of the birds. And these were all to me. I should have wept to die. Now it's my only consolation. Isn't that so true of both? To where I'm supposed to be, says Cathy. Death is freedom. What is their role? Polluted by crimes, torn by the bitterest remorse. Where can I find rest but in death? And that's a difference between Never and Frankenstein. The clones have a purpose. The creature never does. Two hundred and forty seven in Never it says, You could not hate me more than I hate myself. Being heard, purpose. So we've got some interesting ideas. Purpose. Being heard. Kathy tells her tale and it's positive. Accepting. Brief. But it's the whole, it's the human span, isn't it? Whereas the monster, the creature, no purpose. Dies like a hero on a funeral pile, and yet it's not. Attempting. He dies attempting to feel hero, his fate. Not quite hero, it's something. Attempting to feel like he has a place. That's it. Farewell, I leave you, and in the last of humankind who these eyes will ever behold. Farewell, Frankenstein. If thou wert yet alive and yet cherished a desire of revenge against me, it would be better satiated my life in my, than in my destruction. But it was not so. Thou didst seek my extinction. You wanted me dead, that I might not cause greater wretchedness. And yet, in some mode unknown to me, if there's a way unknown to me, you haven't ceased to think and feel. So the idea, if you're still able to hear me, Yet thou would do not, not desire against me vengeance greater than which I feel. So your vengeance, your demand for vengeance against me is not more than I already feel. Blast as thou wert, my agony was still superior. So it's, it's interesting, he's still claiming superiority over Frankenstein at the end. That so wants superiority. He's still justifying himself. Not unlike Frankenstein. But the bitter stings of remorse will not cease to rankle in my wounds until death shall close them forever. But soon he cried with sad and solemn enthusiasm, I shall die and what I now felt be no longer felt. Soon these burning miseries will be extinct. I shall extend my funeral pile triumphantly and exult in the agony of the torturing flames. The light of that conflagration will fade away. My ashes will be swept into the sea by the winds. My spirit will sleep in peace and or if it thinks, it will not surely think thus farewell. He sprang from the cabin window. As he said this upon the ice raft which lay close to the vessel, he was soon borne away by the waves and lost in darkness and distance. So he's eloquent to the end, he's persuasive. He still wants someone to believe him, for him to be important, to be heard. So the protagonist dies, so Walton can finish his narration. What's interesting is he gives credibility. He doesn't carry out Frankenstein's demand. It feels very sudden. What happens to Walton? And it feels very sudden. There's kind of the sense of verisimilitude. Um, but what's interesting is Walton doesn't complete Frankenstein's last demands. Needing to be heard continues to the end. Wanting to be heard. And in these final moments, that call that his 
narrative. His version is important, just like Kathy. Very similar. His version of events is still important. Raging and hope as well are important in both. And that sense of hope to the end to be heard to be important. Good. 